So as Elizabeth was saying, Transfiguration Sunday is not really a, it's not really a hallmark kind of holiday. You don't uh, find people pouring over the, uh, the drugstore card rack trying to find just the right Transfiguration card for their family. It's a little bit like the, the Arbor Day of the church year in some ways. It's particularly interesting to me because as we follow electionary, as you've heard me say before, we have certain readings on certain days, we've got Easter, Christmas, everything comes in a certain cycle. Many Protestant churches use the Revised Common Lectionary, but some churches have their own lectionary, like the Roman Catholic Church, it might not surprise you that they have their own, but it's very similar to ours. Most, the vast majority of Sundays, the readings are either identical or overlapping, and the focus is the same. Easter is Easter, Christmas is Christmas. But transfiguration in their tradition, from what I understand, happened somewhere in the summer. And you notice in our reading here, we've jumped from the first chapter of Mark, where we've been the last few Sundays, suddenly to chapter 9, and then we'll be kind of all over the place as we move through Mark. It's like we're grabbing a story out of context in a way and throwing it right here. Transfiguration Sunday, the Sunday before the beginning of Lent. So in Lent, as we all know, begins with Ash Wednesday that some people call Valentine's Day. But I heard, I heard that you can't spell Valentine without Lent, right? So keep that in mind. But as we begin this journey of moving through Lent, we get a glimpse of something else. We're not there yet. We're on the kind of the, the precipice of this journey, right? When I was on my sabbatical, the first thing that I did was I climbed into my car and I drove 6,600 miles like you do in 16 days. And uh, I did a lot of planning for this. I had kind of routes and things and you, you kind of get ready for this journey. And Lent in many ways, maybe not the same exact kind of planning, but this idea of a journey, something that we're going on. And this is the breath that we take before we move into it. Now, in the story, Jesus takes his disciples up the mountain, a couple of the disciples, and suddenly something happens that's unexpected. They suddenly see Elijah and Moses. They see them talking with Jesus. There's a bit of a passing of the torch, the mantle, as the case might be. As we hear from the first reading, we hear of Elijah and Elisha. This image of a new generation, and yet at the end of it, Jesus suddenly is illuminated. He is transfigured, right? He is changed. His clothes become not just white, but dazzling white, such that nobody could make them. Something unexpected has happened. The thing I want you to catch in this, there are a couple of pieces. One is a small one, kind of classic Peter. He's terrified, doesn't know what to say, and immediately then launches into a speech, right? That's kind of classic Peter. I, I, I don't have anything to say, but just bear with me here while I get started. Um, he wants to stay up there. It says create dwellings. Dwellings is probably not quite the right word in English. I don't think he's picturing pouring concrete and things like this. But this image of a place to stay, even in a temporary space, something that would be celebrated, it's reminiscent of when his mother-in-law was healed. Jesus went off to the wilderness in the dark. Peter hunted for him, said, hey, there are people back at the house that need healing, just like last night. Jesus says, that's great, but we're going on. We're going on. Now, when we think of the story in the idea of a journey, we see that Jesus has been transfigured. As we gather in 2024 and we think of this Lenten journey as we begin to move towards Ash Wednesday, we move through the 40 days of Lent with your helpful guidepost Lenten devotional, and we move through these steps, we know the story, right? We're not like the first disciples who are moving through this for the first time, right? 
we know the story. We know on Ash Wednesday we'll remember our mortality. We'll move on to Palm Sunday, and we remember the palms and the entrance to Jerusalem. We know the story of the Last Supper. We know the story of Good Friday. And we know the story of Easter. In many ways, as we gather on Transfiguration Sunday, and we hear about Jesus being transfigured, it's as though this word afraid comes back to us. Don't be afraid of the journey ahead. Christ, God's Son, is with you. It will be okay. There may be dark stretches, parts of the journey that you'd rather not take. But before you even begin, remember that Jesus is God's Son. That's the glimpse we get before we move into these 40 days. Now, as Peter, wanting to get all things sorted and not hurting for speech when he probably should be quiet, wants to stay, right? Jesus is not interested in staying. He comes down the mountain and moves on. And this is where I think it's important for us to think about this a little bit geographically, not so much in a coordinates or east-west, north-south sort of way. But Jesus is on the move. He's not staying put. He had healed a number of people, went into the wilderness. Peter said, come back. And Jesus said, no, we're going on. He goes up the mountain. Peter says, this is fabulous, let's stay. No, we're going down, we're going on. What else happens in this journey? The image in particular is that this is a journey on a path, on a road, on a way that is going to Jerusalem. Jesus is not stopping until he goes to Jerusalem. Now we can flash forward a little bit and, and Jesus will say, you know, this is what's going to happen when I get to Jerusalem. And what does Peter do at that point? Whoa, whoa, hey, <laughs> can we just stay? This is a nice spot. Why do, we, why do we need to go and do that? Why don't we stay put? And what does Jesus say? Very hard words. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. We are going to Jerusalem. This is a journey that we know, but it's a journey that we do every year. I want to finish with something not so much uh, about the text today, but about the journey kind of in general. As Protestants, we don't have a big history of giving things up for Lent, but if we come from areas that are heavily Catholic, we might have that kind of in our bones. And often it's something to give up. Have you noticed that it's usually something we probably ought to just give up for good and not just for Lent? But uh, I think in some ways there's a better way to think of Lent. Lent is an opportunity to add something, not forever necessarily, but to add something for these 40 days. A word that we might use in Lent that's not super fun, but we might say a discipline, a discipline of Lent. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe it's some exercise that you don't normally do. Maybe that would be it. Maybe it's reading your devotional from here. Maybe it's something else, but something that you add to your routine to mark this time out as separate and different, something that is going to set it apart as we move through these weeks from where we are to Jerusalem, to a cross outside of Jerusalem, but ultimately, as we know, every Sunday that we celebrate, an empty tomb outside of Jerusalem. Amen.